As the 11th president of the World Bank Group from 2007 to 2012, Bob brought new life to the institution. He recapitalized the bank, expanded financing for the poorest countries following the food, fuel, and financial crises. His voice was one of the first and most articulate to identify the human dimension of the global financial crisis. Bob also refocused the bank on good governance and anti-corruption, making the bank more accountable, agile, and transparent. He encouraged developing countries to set up their own priorities rather than have them dictated by the bank. Under his leadership, the World Bank and the IFC were able to play a more active role in responding to the international economic crisis than they would have otherwise. Back in the late 1980s and early 1990s, at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union, Bob served in both the State Department and the Treasury Department with Jim Baker. And it was on their watch that Eurasia Foundation was created. Bob later served as a member of the Eurasia Foundation's Board of Trustees under Sarah Carey as chair and Bill Frenzel as vice chair. In all of his service through a distinguished and continuing career, we have all benefited immensely from his experience, his wisdom, and his friendship. So Bob, thank you for being here tonight to mark 20 years of Eurasia Foundation's good work. Please join me in welcoming Bob Zellick. Well, thank you very much, Drew, for that uh, extremely generous introduction. And thanks to all of you for the invitation to be with you this evening. Um, it was a particular pleasure because I was invited by my uh, friend Bill Frenzel, a man from whom I've learned a great deal over the years. And I understood that all of you associated uh, with the Eurasia Foundation have also uh, had the opportunity and enjoyed it as I have. Uh, to come to know that Bill is the very best of partners and colleagues, uh, one who brings wisdom, insight, uh, plain hard work, and also a nice dose of humor, too. So, Bill, I want to have a special thanks to you. It's also a particular honor to be here with Senator uh, Richard Luger, uh, who just received the very well-deserved award for the far-sighted work that he and Senator Nunn have undertaken over the years, and it's very wonderful that Secretary Albright was able to come here and be able to present the Kerry Award herself. Uh, Senator Luger uh, has been a role model uh, for me and I know uh, for many others. I told him as the dinner began, I recently had the opportunity to visit Purdue University at the invitation of uh, President Mitch Daniels, another beneficiary of Senator Luger's grace and decency and drive for high standards of public service. So it's with my fellow Midwesterners, Dick Luger and Bill Frenzel and Mitch Daniels as evidence, I'd like to posit tonight that America's true steady internationalism is rooted in the heartland of the United States. <laughs> But I also want to thank uh, all of you for the work that you do, starting with Jan and Horton for your leadership, uh, the staff for your incredible commitments and efforts that you do every day of the year, and to the Eurasia Foundation supporters for backing this very important idea and organization. Now, as you heard a little bit, I had the opportunity to work with Secretary of State James Baker during the Bush 41 administration when we first came up with the idea of a Eurasia Foundation. Uh, we launched the notion in the bill that became the Freedom Support Act. And to give you a sense of the origin, we were trying to figure out at that time how best to assist after an incredible and unexpected event. Not only the end of the Cold War that had defined our lives, but the very breakup of the Soviet Union. Now, we had launched enterprise funds in Central and Eastern Europe as those once captive nations achieved their freedom. And the idea behind those funds was to look beyond traditional forms of US assistance to boost the development of their private sector. Yet we knew that Russia and the other states of Eurasia needed something different to help build open and free societies as well as private enterprise. Of course, 
neither we nor anyone else could forecast with any specificity how best to help. So the idea was to create this foundation, drawing on the insights, talents, experience, and learning of others, now all of you, to establish an organic, adaptable policy response. So I had a rush of memories when Horton uh, shared with me a copy of John Stremlau's uh, mo uh, memo of January 1992 to my colleague uh, Dennis Ross, who was then Director of Policy Planning. It was the formal recommendation of the creation of the Eurasia Foundation out of some additional assistance funds that Secretary Baker uh, had requested. And in those days, the Policy Planning Office actually reported through my office, so I guess I had the opportunity to be present uh, at the creation. So I'm grateful for the energies and abilities of people, such as the late Sarah Carey and also Bill Maines, and many, many others who over 20 years have given great content to the raw early idea for the Eurasia Foundation. I've begun with this look back uh, both because it's appropriate for this 20th anniversary at the start of the Asia Foundation's operation, but also because it might give us some perspective on our time and the challenges that are ahead. Today is May 9th, and this day has some historical moment too. For the Russians celebrate May 9th, 1945, as the day of victory in what they call the Great Patriotic War, World War II. It's been 68 tumultuous years for the Russians. Almost 22 years ago, their country, the Soviet Union, one of the victories, victorious uh, powers of World War II, was dissolved. Within one long lifetime, one could have witnessed the birth of the Soviet Union, its invasion by Nazi Germany, the repulse, and then the march of the Red Army throughout Europe, on to the very end of the Soviet state, and then forward to today. Therefore, while this is a time of some frustration and even pessimism about Russia for many people, I suspect that the process of change in Russia has not run its course. As Novoya Gazeta journalist Andrei Kolosovnov was quoted as saying at the Gaidar Forum earlier this year, do not underestimate the unpredictable. So how might we reflect on what's happened. Well, Bill Burns, the current U.S. Deputy Secretary of State and formerly a very effective U.S. Ambassador to Russia, offered a very insightful perspective to me a number of years ago that I want to share with you. When President Putin came to power, Bill reflected, the conditions he saw around him looked like a great Russian's worst nightmare, especially for one whose worldview was that of a KGB colonel. Russia seemed to be disintegrating. Territorially, as revolts in the South threatened to eat away at the Russia that was left when the USSR broke up. Internally and institutionally, through corruption, criminality. Internationally, as Russia receded from great power standing, struggling with a sense of humiliation. In human terms, through alcohol and illness. And the economy seemed controlled by oligarchs, People who wouldn't have counted in the old order, but in the late 1990s, they and their spouses were dripping with ostentatious wealth, while Putin and the old guardians of the state struggled with a threadbare existence. So President Putin resorted to one what might have expected from a Russian KGB colonel. He sought to restore the power of the Russian state. He used police power, unleashed the military to crush opponents, reasserted control over natural resources, and established a state capitalism. Regionally, he tried to extend control over CIS neighbors. Internationally, Russia showed that it could dispense favors and cause difficulties. And Putin way overshot his drive for so-called order. Yet some things happened along the way that Putin might not have expected. The new Russia created a consumer class, not yet a middle class in my view, not yet a majority, but a new influence on the scene. And many Russians, unlike most Soviets, gained exposure to the world. While it may take time 
I suspect that the attitudes of the Russian public will change over time through that experience. I believe that President Putin doesn't fully understand these new forces. His anxiety about them prompted his hostility to the movements last year and the crackdown. Putin can mobilize support in the provinces and in the state bureaucracies. The oligarchs also came to their terms. But will Russians ultimately see Putin's moves as a sign of strength or one of weakness? Can Russia be ruled and controlled if increasing numbers in Moscow and St. Petersburg no longer fully support the rulers? Now, the resolve of the West was important in the eventual demise of the Soviet Empire. But so, frankly, was oil at $15 a barrel. Gorbachev realized that the old USSR couldn't keep up. Now, economically, Russia is still very dependent on energy and energy prices. At least until recently, Russia's leaders drew down energy wealth without investing in future sources. Now, Lee Kuan Yew, who's a frank observer, if there ever were one, had this to say about Russia in a recent book of interviews that was edited by Graham Allison and Bob Blackwell. He explained that Russia, quote, has been unable to develop an economy that generates wealth independent of exports of energy and raw materials. The Russian population, he said, is declining. Alcoholism plays a role, so do pessimism, declining fertility rate, and a declining life expectancy. Siberia and Vladivostok are filling up with more and more Chinese. Lands on the bend of the Amur River will be repopulated with Chinese. The system is not functioning, he said, because it has gone haywire. Well, this is not exactly a ringing endorsement. <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew concluded that Vladimir Putin's challenge is to give Russians a hopeful outlook for the future. I would add from a strategic perspective that Putin's Russia has permitted its historical resentments to blind it to Russia's real external challenges, which are to the south and the east, certainly not to the west. Putin's efforts to rewire the Soviet Union and Central Asia have just led to suspicions, and yet, and yet, some recent Russian officials have sought to move the economy in a better direction. Former Finance Minister Alexei Kudrin managed Russia's budget, debt, and macroeconomy with great skill. Former Economics Minister and now Sparebank CEO German Greff pushed reforms that eventually got Russia into the WTO. Russia enjoys sizable financial reserves and human capital. There seem to be prospects now for educational reforms, too. Putin recognizes the need for economic diversification, and other Russians recognize that the country has to be able to invest in human capital and the quality of institutions, including better and transparent business regulation, public administration, and the judiciary. Privatized and new enterprises comprise the fastest growing part of Russia's economy especially small and medium-sized enterprises in the services sector. State capitalism, in contrast, leads to government capture, deeper corruption through regulations, subsidies, and protection from competition. In their new book, Mr. Putin, Cliff Gaddy and Fiona Hill contend that Putin recognizes the failures of the Soviet economy, but that Putin's view of markets is one of exploiting rivals' vulnerabilities and wheeling and dealing. It's a world of making, not earning money. So how should the US and others deal with today's Russia? In my view, the posturing about reset was unfortunate. It suggested that US differences with Russia were just because of President Bush's policies and that a fresh start by thoughtful people would make all the difference. Frankly, I had the same skepticism about this perspective as I did about this perspective as I did when President Bush thought that he could look into Putin's heart. <laughs> we need to be realistic, neither hostile nor expecting that style will change the substance. I suspect that most dealings with Russia will be transactional, and we should still look for mutual interests that we can pursue. But drawing from the historical perspective with which I began tonight, we should recognize that incredible changes of the past decades have not run their course. 
Working with Germany and other European partners, the U.S. should be supporting the political economic development of Russia's neighbors because their changes will affect Russia's prospects and choices too. Ukraine is critically important, yet so are Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova. EU association agreements can have influence and encourage the freedom of movement of goods, services, capital, labor, and ideas. In Central Asia, although conditions are difficult, the US, the EU, the multilateral institutions, and other partners should encourage the management of tensions over water and energy. There are win-win possibilities, and if distrust can be overcome, and practical successes can be the basis for building better ties among the Central Asian countries. The world has also learned the hard way about how to pursue resource development in ways that support inclusive growth, transparency, institutional development, and future generations. In Russia itself, the U.S. should support the development of a wider middle class, private enterprise, the rule of law, and the institutions of civil society. Which brings us back to the continuing importance of the work of the Eurasia Foundation, its partners, and its supporters. Your move to a Eurasia Foundation network has been a smart adaptation to the challenging and changing circumstances. The activities that I've described in Russia, in the European and Asian neighbors, grow out of the networks that the Eurasia Foundation has encouraged. Your projects supporting independent journalists, the institutions of justice, community, civil society groups, internet freedom, and the very important fellowships are the enablers of this future. I also hope that you can focus on special challenges for girls and women. At the World Bank Group, we stress that gender equality is not only the fair and right thing to do, it's smart economics. Our research revealed how attention to limits for girls and women, formal and informal, could make a big difference for economies, societies, and critically, the future generations. And we also learned that successful transformations have to be grounded in local capacities, institutions, and cultures. Over the past year and in many jobs, I've observed that the most vital ingredient for effective, resilient reform is local ownership. Outsiders can help with assistance, experience, even financing, but the reforms will not succeed without local ownership. And that's the case for your work too. The process of change for Russia and its neighbors will continue. And I look forward to the Eurasia Foundation and its network of partners making even more contrib contributions to that dynamic in the years ahead. So take pride in the accomplishments of 20 years and put them to work for the future yet to come. Thank you. Thank you.